get started and we're going to do uh, eschatology part two which is simply the study of end times and uh, we did part one last week and we're just going to look through the book of revelation and uh, just see what god's doing you know i, I just uh really <laughs> I just, uh, you know, the more we go through the story and, and, and see what God's doing in the upper story, you know, it gives us hope in the lower story. Because, uh, you know, God's got a plan. He's got an eternal plan, and, and that's his upper story. He, he started it back in, in Genesis, you know, to, to redeem mankind. He said uh, right there in the garden, he said, I'm going to raise up one whose heel is going to bruise the head of Satan, and that was Jesus. And so God has, has been throughout the ages, you know, uh, giving shadows and types of the Messiah to come. And then, you know, John says, uh, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So, so the word uh, and all the prophecies, uh, you know, prior to his first advent, you know, came to pass. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And, and that happened. I mean, it's historical. And everything that God said, uh, how Jesus would be born and how he would die and what he was going to do on this earth, it came to pass. 330 prophecies of Christ's incarnation. So the, the next major event, you know, as, has been prophesied about in, in the Old Testament and Daniel, Ezekiel, Zechariah, and, and all these prophecies in the Old Testament will come to pass just like they did come to pass about Jesus' incarnation. So, and so when we see all this craziness going around, it's, it's actually God's going to use this to move his upper story and, and bring things uh, to fulfill his eternal plan. And the thing about it is, is we're, it, we're part of that. We're part of that eternal plan uh, that God has, is, is working out on this earth to redeem mankind from the fall. See, when we're born in this world, we're born with a sinful nature, but God so loved us that he gave us his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. So, and, and, and Jesus said, you must be born again because that which is flesh is flesh and that which is spirit is spirit. So when, we're, when we accept Christ, he he restores us, and we have a relationship back with God, just the way we were created. When I first started seeking God, I got into all kinds of spiritual things, but uh, I was led to the Lord by an ex-heroin addict, uh, and, and God had changed my life from that day on. And I found out it wasn't in a church. It was in an old Chevy led uh, by an ex-heroin addict led me to the Lord. And so God is real, and, and, and it, the, the spiritual realm is more real than the natural realm because the spiritual realm created the things that we see. Everything that we see is going to rust out, burn out, or wear out. But the eternal realm is forever. And so that's why in Colossians 3 it says, Set your, If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Uh, and then it says, for your dead and your life is hid with Christ and God. And when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then we also will appear with him in glory. So I want to give you a review of what we covered last week, and then we'll, we'll go on here. But the writer of uh, the book of Revelation is John. And uh, it was written in 95 A.D., and he was about that age. He was in his 90s. And it was written from the island of Patmos in the Aegean Sea, and John was banished there. So uh, this island wasn't a vacation resort. It was only 13 square miles, and it was nothing but rocks and kind of desolate. And it was more or less a labor camp, and they would mine marble there. And so John was, was doing this in his 90s you know, when he should have been retiring in the Bahamas somewhere. But uh, so John was in his 90s when he received this revelation from Jesus Christ. And the revelation of Jesus Christ God gave unto him, uh, 
to show his servants. And so God gave John this revelation to show his servants. How many of you are the servants of God? So in other words, God gave this revelation so his people wouldn't be in the dark about what's going to happen in the end times. So it's like God gave you the, the game plan of everything that's going to happen in the last days. And he gave it to his servants. Isn't that awesome? That he didn't want us to be in the dark of what's going to be happening uh, in the last days. So he gave it to us. And uh, that will shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it uh, by his angel unto the servant John. That's Revelations 1.1. And it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's not of John. And the Greek word is uh, apocalypse, which we get uh, apocalypse from. It just simply means unveiling or a revealing. So this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, throughout the book of Revelation, Jesus is going to be revealed. Who he is and what he's going to do. Uh, there was... Uh, a revealing of Jesus Christ. There's 32 titles about Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation. And nine of them were in the first chapter, and we went over those last week. Um, and, and we looked at that timeline. It's up there. But if you see, uh, that's kind of just a breakdown of what's going to happen. And we've already, you know, the Jesus' death and resurrection and ascension has already taken place. And so right now we're in the church age, and we don't know how long that's gonna, how long that's gonna be. But we're part of that time period right there. We're in the church age, and then, you know, I, I told you I used to be pre-trib and other our post-trib. I used to think that I would, we'd have to go through the tribulation, but the Lord kind of changed my mind on that. So I'm I'm pre-trib. So that means that before the tribulation happens. We're going to be, the church is going to be taken out of the world. And then we don't know, the Bible doesn't say how long it'll be uh, when the great tribulation um, starts. But it's going to be a great tribulation. It's going to be seven years of great tribulation. And the reason why it's going to be a great tribulation, because God's trying to wake people up. And uh, he's going to use this great tribulation to try and bring the hard-hearted uh, those who re have rejected him uh, to the saving faith of Jesus Christ. The Bible said that one day every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess. That doesn't mean that they're going to be saved. That means they're going to recognize that he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And so there's going to be seven years of great tribulation. And, uh, and then uh, there's going to be a thousand-year millennial reign. And I want to be there for that. Amen. And then God is going to create a new heavens and a new earth. So if you're trying to save this one, sorry, God's going to put, <laughs> create a new heavens and new earth. But, uh, and, and that's in Revelation 21. That's awesome because if you read that, God's going to restore everything that was lost through the fall. And it's going to be restored. So it's the revelation of Jesus Christ, the re revealing of Jesus Christ. And I said last week that there's three methods uh, of interpretation to the book uh, that is used to interpret the book of Revelation. And the first one was allegorical. Uh, everything is about symbolism. The symbolism is a book of, uh, in the book of Revelation, comes from John. So the, the symbolism, how many get tripped up in the symbolism of the book of Revelation? I mean, that's kind of what kept me out of it for a long time. I've read it. You know, but, the, you know, the, all the symbolism and stuff. And, and, and when I was uh, studying for this, I found out that uh, the reason why there's so much symbolism is because John had limited language to describe futuristic events. In other words, he, he, his, his language just was just limited to what he knew in his time period. So if... if God, if, if the Lord Jesus showed him a tank, I mean, the only way he could describe it is uh, it was an iron chariot, you know, because that's all they had back in those days. So a lot of that symbolism comes from John just simply having limited language to describe futuristic events. 
So there's <clears throat> the allegorical, and then there's the historical, which uh, those who hold to this view just feel that it already happened in John's days. And it was just kind of an encouraging book. And then there's the literal futuristic view. And that's the one that we're holding to, is that the, the book is literal and it's futuristic. And uh, this, is, this is the only book in the Bible you will receive a blessing if you read it and a cursing if you take away from it. And so you're going to be blessed this morning because I'm going to read it and you're going to hear it. So get ready for a blessing. And the Bible says, if any man takes away from the words of this book of prophecy, God shall take away his part of the book of life out of the holy city and from the things which are written in the book. So last week we just had an introduction of the book of Revelation. And so let's start. Let's, uh, let's just read the whole book. Um, the whole, not the whole book. <laughs> A lot of you start looking at your watch. Oh, Lord. <laughs> so I'm, I'm waiting for it to come up here. Okay, here we go. We're going to read the whole chapter here. And then we're going to come back and we're going to pick it apart and go verse by verse. So the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angels to his servant John. Now, uh, I think the King James Version says that it will quickly take place, uh, or that, uh, yeah, shortly take place, but it, it really means that it'll happen. When it happens, it'll happen very fast. Jesus said it's going to happen as like a twinkling in the eye. Just as you bat your eye, that's how fast it's going to happen. So when the Lord comes back, it's going to happen so fast, you're not going to have time to repent or get right with God. It's going to just happen just like that. And so... <clears throat> The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us, and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us a kingdom uh, and has and made us a kingdom priest to his god and the father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever amen behold he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him and every tongue and even those who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account uh of him even so amen i am the alpha and the omega says the lord who is who was and who is to come the almighty <clears throat> and i john your brother and partner in tribulation and the kingdom and the patience endurance the and the kingdom and the patience endurance that are in jesus who was in the isle called patmos Patmos, on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. That's why he was there is because of he was being persecuted for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. <clears throat> it goes on to say, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book <clears throat> and send it to the seven churches 
in Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamos and Tyatira and Sardis and Philadelphia. That's not Pennsylvania. And to Laodicea. <clears throat> then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And turning, I saw even a golden lampstand. And in the midst of the lampstand, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a long robe <clears throat> and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like, <clears throat> like wool, like snow. His eyes were like the flame of fire. His feet were like uh, a burnished bronze, refined in the fire. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. <clears throat> And in his right hand he held the seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. And when I saw him, <clears throat> I fell to my feet as though one dead. But he laid his right hand on me and saying, Fear not, for I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I keep the keys of, of death and of hell. Write, these, write, therefore, these things that you have seen, those things that are uh, to take place. And after this, as, as for the mysteries of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, they are the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Let's pray. Lord, we just <clears throat> ask that you would give us wisdom and understanding into this book, Lord. And that, you know, we would understand and discern the times in which we live, Lord God. Let us not be blind or caught off guard, God. But let us be open and understanding what you're doing in your upper story and how it's going to affect our lower story. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's, <clears throat> let's go back and look at this now. We're going to start with verse 4. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is, which was, and which is to come. And this simply reflects his eternal nature and his unchanging presence. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He, he was, he is, and who is to come. God has been there from day one, and Jesus has been there right from creation. He was, he is, and he is to come. And it goes on to say, and to the seven spirits which are before his throne. And there's three different ideas on that. The seven spirits are the fullness of the Holy Spirit, um, the seven virtues of the Holy Spirit, and the third one is the reference for seven angels, which I believe that's what it is right there, is reference to seven angels. And then verse 5, <clears throat> and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Jesus <clears throat> is the first begotten from the dead. He is the first one to rise from the dead with a glorified body that will never perish. Lazarus <clears throat> was raised from the dead, but he died again. Jesus rose from the dead and has a, a glorified, incorruptible body. And that's what will happen to us. We'll be raised and we'll have an incorruptible body that will never die. How many are waiting for that? <clears throat> so he is the first begotten from the dead. You know, Christianity is the only religion that claims their Messiah rose from the dead. Mohammed is dead. People go and visit his remains in Mecca. 
Buddhists, all the other ones never rose from the dead. Jesus rose from the dead. And he, he, he took the keys of hell and of death. He broke the power of sin and death. <clears throat> Sometimes when I do funerals, I talk about how Jesus broke the power of death. You know, death is, is the hardest thing sometimes we face as humans and when we lose loved ones and everything. But if you're a Christian, it, it's not a bad thing because Jesus broke the keys of hell and of death. And the Bible says that these words are written that you might know you have eternal life. <clears throat> I know that I know that I know I have eternal life. And <clears throat> if, if I were to ask you this morning, what do you think is going to happen to you if you die? You think you'll go to heaven? You think you'll be with the Lord? And if, you're, if your answer is, well, I really don't know, but I'm a pretty good person, you're trying to get in on your own righteousness. And the Bible said it's not by works of righteousness, which we've done, but it's according to his mercy he saved us by the washing and the regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. So <clears throat> Jesus is the first begotten of the dead. The devil lost his mind when he saw Jesus rose from the dead because he thought he had him when he crucified him. So he is the first <clears throat> begotten from the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth. Jesus is the first one to rise from the dead and get a glorified body. And then it goes on to say, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And I, I love that. He washed us and cleansed us from our sin in his own blood. There's nothing on this earth that will cleanse you from your sin and, and rid you of your guilt and your condemnation except the blood of Jesus. Bill Gates, with all of his money and all the tech giants, cannot erase their sin and their guilt and their condemnation with all the money they have. The only thing that will cleanse people from their sin and give them a clear conscience and a right standing with God is the blood of Jesus. That's the only thing. <clears throat> you might be so condemned or so guilty this morning because of maybe things that you've done in your past, but Jesus can totally wipe that out and forgive you. You can walk out of this place a brand new creature in Christ. The Bible says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So he is the first begotten of the dead unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And he's made us kings and priests unto God and the Father, to him be glory forever and ever. Amen. And then verse 7, it says, <clears throat> Behold, he comes with clouds. Now, <clears throat> that's not these puffy white things that we all know are clouds. In Hebrews 11.1, 1, it says that we are surrounded with this great cloud of witnesses. And Jesus is coming back with his saints. And that's the great cloud that he's talking about, is, is when he comes back in the second phase of his coming, he'll come back with the saints, and it's going to be a great cloud. And, and, it, and it goes on to say that <clears throat> every eye shall see him. No one's going to miss this. Every person on this earth will see him. And how do you think 
that would ever happen before all this technology was brought about. I mean, every eye can see this major event, unless CNN decides not to put it on there. <laughs> no, we ain't touching that one. <laughs> I mean, <clears throat> Jesus might not need all that. But nobody's going to say, oh, I missed that. You know, the Bible says that every eye will see him. Every eye will see him. And they which also pierced him. And all the kingdoms, all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. And it goes on to say, verse 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I love that. The beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Jesus starts to reveal himself here. And remember, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. He is the Alpha and Omega. The Enduring Word comp, uh, Commentary says that the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the idea behind these titles for Jesus is that he is before all things and will remain beyond all things. Alpha was the first letter of the ancient Greek alphabet, and Omega was the last letter. Jesus says, I'm from A to Z, the beginning and the end. He is the sum total of everything. In other words, he's got you covered from beginning to end. And the Bible says that he's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. God is, is the Alpha, and he is the Omega. And we could rest into that. And then verse 9 through 11, it says, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation. See, that's a little t. Tribulation, there's a little t. But there's going to be a great tribulation. And John says, I'm your companion. Matter of fact, he, he was writing this from being in a, a slave camp. And he's their brother and companion in tribulation. In the kingdom and patience. I, you know, this just jumped out of me. Have you ever had verses just jump out at you? And it says this. And the patience of Jesus Christ. I never thought how much patience Jesus Christ has got to have with us. Now, don't look at me all sanctified. <laughs> because I know Jesus Christ has had much patience with a lot of us. Awful quiet. <laughs> And so John says that, and he says that who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad Jesus has patience with us? I mean, he's, he's just, you know, he's patient with us. He's not going to throw us out of the kingdom when we mess up. He's patient with us. The Bible says that, that nothing shall separate us from the love of God. Neither <coughs> death or life or principalities or powers or things present or things to come. He's patient with us. Tell the person next to you, Jesus is patient with you. And then say, I thank God for that. <laughs> and he goes on to say, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. <coughs> and he goes on to say, I was in the spirit. And, and that actually translates, I was in spirit. He was in spirit. So, you know, 
we, we all get in the spirit, you know, when we're worshiping God and, and maybe studying God's word or, you know, uh, you know, around fellowship, Christian fellowship, we're, we're in the spirit. But John was in spirit. In other words, he was caught up into this, this open vision, you know, like Paul said in Corinthians, when he had an experience like that, he said, I don't know if I was in the body or out of the body. You know, he was caught up into the third heavens. And so John was, the, the thing that he had was like an open vision to him, you know. And he was seeing all these things. You know, I don't know if it was a big screen or what, but it was just an open vision. He was just watching all these things take place. And 12 times Jesus had to say, hey, John, write this down in the book, because he was probably, wow, wow, you know. And, and Jesus had to remind him, now write this down. We know what, write down what you're seeing, John. <coughs> so he was in spirit on the Lord's day. And I, I'm just going to throw it. This ain't, ain't no calm down. I'm just going to throw this out. But <laughs> it, what is the Lord's day? It's Sunday. And so when we come and worship God, the Spirit of God is here to minister to us. And what if John wasn't there? What if he decided, you know, when Jesus started opening this vision up, saying, oh, well, I'm going to do something else. See, a lot of times we get things that we need when we're honoring God and, and are in fellowship with one another. And, and we're doing the things that God wants us to do. You, you might not come because you're not feeling well or you're thinking something's going on, but you're liable to miss what God's got for you. I remember when I used to go to Victory Church and before we started this church and, and I would miss church and I'd always wonder what they preached about, you know, and I'd say, well, what, what was the message last week? And they would tell me and I'd go, oh, man, I really needed that. <laughs> and, and I missed out. So I, I just want to encourage you. That was free. That uh, wasn't in my notes. But there's just something the Bible says Oh, this is good. The Bible says not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Now listen to this. Even much more so as you see the day approaching. Whoa. That's heavy. Even much more so as you see the day approaching. And I think the reason for that is because <coughs> there's so much deception out there. And it's so easy to get deceived. And the devil is just a master of deception. And so he goes on to say, saying, I am the Alpha Omega, the last event. And what you see, here it is, write it in the book, John, and send it unto the seven churches where are in Asia, unto Ephesus, unto Samaria, unto Pergamos, unto Thyatira, unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. If you want to show that map there of, of that. I think it's, the, yeah, so that's where they're at there, what is modern-day Turkey. These churches actually existed in the first century. These were actual churches that existed in the first century. And they are spiritual, and they're relevant to believers today. And they're also historical. So they're spiritual and they're relevant for churches today. And we're going to get into those, uh, those churches and we're going to see how those, what, what, what Jesus rebuked them of and what he commanded them or commended them for, we could see that it applies to churches today. And so they were, they were real churches and uh, they were historical and they're relevant to believers today. And then John says, I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And being I turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And, and these are the seven churches. The candlesticks represent the ch seven churches. Now, what's, what's significant about that? What did Jesus say that we are? We're the light of the world. And so... It, it's, it's awesome that the church is represented by candles, candlesticks. 
because we're the light of the world. And how do you get rid of darkness? Light. You turn the light on. You could yell at the darkness all you want. You know, you can get mad at the darkness all you want. But the only way to get rid of darkness is to turn the light on. And see, the, the church today needs to be the light because there's a lot of darkness out there. And so we could yell at all the things that are going on in the world. We can get mad about it. And, you know, I mean, we're supposed to do what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to vote uh, accord to biblical values. But the only thing that's going to change the hearts of people and change this world is the light. It's the only thing that's going to dispel the darkness. <clears throat> and then verse 13 to 16. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and gird about uh, the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hair were like white like wool, and as white as snow, and his eyes were like the flame of fire, and his feet like fine brass, and as they, if they turned uh, and burned in the furnace, and his voice was the sound of many waters. <clears throat> And he had in his right hand the seven stars, and out of his mouth was a sharp two-edged sword, and his contents, his countenance was like the sun that shineth in his strength. The closing of Jesus indicates that he is a person of great dignity and authority. You know, when he he first came on this earth, he was crucified and he, he rose from the dead, but now he sits on the right hand of the Father, and he has all authority and all power. The Bible says there's, there's no name above his name, and he is the head of all principality and power and might and dominion. So Jesus right now is in his glorified body with all power and with all might. There is no power on this earth that is greater than the power of Christ. He is, he is, he's over all principalities, powers, might, and dominions. So his clothing indicates that he is a person of great dignity and authority. They were pictures of great status and authority. <clears throat> the golden band around the chest probably hints at the garments of the high priest. And Exodus 39, 1 through 5 says that there were golden threads in the band that went around the chest of the high priest. And Jesus' band has more than just a few threads. Golden threads, it's, it's all gold. And how much greater is the eternal and heavenly priesthood? His hair was like white, like wool, and the white hair speaks of old age. And uh, I got white hair. But I'm really only 35. <laughs> Just kidding. So his white hair uh, speaks of old age and is therefore in the culture connected with the idea of great wisdom. Amen. Amen and timeless. The phrase white as snow also emphasizes the idea of purity. It also was evidence of the glory for the whiteness of the splendor of his head and his hair doubtless proceeded from the rays of light and the glory which enriched his head and darted from all directions. So, I mean, Jesus is, is on fire, man. He's He's in his glorified body. And uh, it says that his eyes were like a flame of fire. And it's also often associated with judgment in the scriptures, <clears throat> Matthew 5.22 and 2 Peter 3.7. Jesus' eyes displayed the fire of searching, penetrating judgment. Has anybody ever looked at you like they're getting ready to nail you? 
I mean, some of you kids know when your mom <laughs> looks at you a certain way, it's getting ready to get ugly. <laughs> well, Jesus' eyes are like fire. And he's getting ready. He's getting ready to bring wrath upon this earth. In other words, all the people that think they're getting away with all the perversion and all their deception and all their hate and, and all their abuse, Jesus' eyes are lit up and he's getting ready to bring judgment and wrath. They're going to feel the wrath of God on their sin. But he's going to give them space to repent during that time. When I was going through some training for trail life, it was about how to recognize uh, leaders that have a tendency to abuse kids sexually. And they had this one sexual abuser on there who was telling how he manipulated kids. And, and I felt so grieved in my spirit I felt like God was so angry with that sin that it was just a, a feeling that I've never felt before about anger and wrath of God according to what takes place on this earth. And God feels all that. And that's why <clears throat> he, he the things that that are hurting God's spirit. That's why he puts burdens on us to help make those things right while we're here. So his feet were like fine brass. Since fire is connected with judgment, then his feet are like fine brass as if a refining in a furnace speak of someone who has been brought through the fires of judgment and has come forth with a refining purity. And Jesus has been re refined through the fire. He was wounded. He was bruised. He was crucified. But are, his feet are like refining fire of brass. Brass is also a strong metal, the strongest known in the ancient world. Therefore, feet like brass are an emblem of his stability and its preeminence. Brass being considered the most durable of all metallic substance or compounds. That was by Clark. And it says he had his right hand, <coughs> his right hand had seven stars. And the seven stars speak of the leaders represented of the second seven churches mentioned in Revelations 1.11. The stars are secure in the hand of Jesus since seven is the number of completion. It goes on to say, out of his mouth was a sharp two-edged sword. <coughs> Barnes note that John didn't necessarily see a sword coming out of Jesus' mouth. He heard him speak, and he felt penetrating power of his words, and they were sharp as a sword that proceeded out of his mouth. His countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. The glory of Jesus is great, so shining that it's hard uh, to look upon him. Jesus has the same glory as his, in his transfiguration when his face shone like the sun. And then in verse 17 through 18, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. I mean, can you imagine that? He, John saw him, and he fell at his feet as dead. I mean, if, if Jesus would appear to us in, in his glory, you know, we would fall to our feet because we would feel what Isaiah felt.
And then he told John, don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and death. Aren't you glad that he keeps the keys to hell and of death? He's not going to let the devil borrow them. He keeps the keys of hell and of death. So John was overwhelmed by this awesome vision, even though he was an apostle who knew Jesus on the earth. Even the three years John spent with Jesus on the earth did not really prepare him to see Jesus in his glory. And then he says, who lives, who was dead, and is alive forevermore, and holds the keys of hell and of death. Write these things which you see and have seen, and the things which are and the things which are, here, are hereafter. The things which you have seen, <clears throat> this means that Jesus wanted John to write the things that he had just seen in his vision. The things which are, this means that Jesus wanted John to write then about the present day, the things regarding to the seven churches of Asia. And the things which are to take place, <coughs> this means that Jesus wanted John to write down the things that would happen after the things regarding the seven churches uh, and the things of the last days. So the book of Revelations, Revelation is arranged in three-part structure. The things which you have seen, Revelation 1. The things which are, which are Revelation 2 and 3. And the things which will take place, Revelations 4 through 22. So the last verse says, The mystery of the seven stars, which thou hast seen in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels <coughs> of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks, which thou have seen are the seven churches. So he, he explains what John saw, that the uh, candles of the churches and uh, the seven candlesticks, which thou see here, are the seven churches. And the angel, we're going to discover it, uh, next week that it's not really a spiritual angel. So I'm just going to leave you with that. So that's chapter one, and uh, I think, you know, this book has just kind of opened up to me. It's just kind of uh, seems a lot more um, understandable than it used to be, and I don't know if it's because uh, just the time that we're living in um, and, you know, the things that are happening, and not only that, but us going through the story on Wednesday night. It just all seems to come together and just open it up for me. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that your word is true and uh, everything that you've written about will, will quickly come to pass. And Lord, if I, I get anything out of this book, is I want to be ready. I don't want to be sitting on the fence. I don't want to be cold or hot. I don't want to be lukewarm. I want to be right in your will, in the center of your will, Lord God. So help us, Lord God. Give us that, that fervency and that desire to seek you and, and to stand firm in our faith, Lord God. Even though the world is, is going crazy, Lord, you tell us to be steadfast and unmovable and always abounding in your work because you are the Alpha and the Omega, Everything is going to take place in your timing to fulfill your will. In Jesus' name, amen.